Great. Welcome, everyone, to week nine of the Failure to Disrupt book club. Um, we're looking now at chapter eight, The Toxic Power of Data and Experiment. Uh, very grateful again to have Audrey Waters with us. Um, and then also very happy to welcome Candace Till. Um, Candace Till is the Director of Learning Science at Amazon, um, and she's a former researcher at, uh, a, and faculty member at Stanford University and at Carnegie Mellon. She's the uh, one of the leads of the Open Learning Initiative Project um, and has done some very innovative work in developing new online learning experiences, in spreading and sharing new online learning experiences, in creating uh, sort of norms and values uh, and, and communities around this kind of research um, and, uh, and publishing you know, some really important pieces as well. So, Candice, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, uh, Candice, we like to get people to introduce themselves by talking about their kind of ed tech moment. Um, is, there, is there some piece from your personal history as a student or a teacher where education technology really captured your attention and interests? Uh, yes. I'm going to, can I give two? Yes, yeah, take the floor. <laughs> a, a, a positive and a, a, a sort of mind shaper. <laughs> so Great. the positive one was when I first uh, started the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon uh, University, and we created this um, introductory statistics course online. And uh, faculty, uh, we made it available, openly available to faculty all over the country to use to teach introductory statistics. And a faculty member, and we at the time also did like little faculty workshops to help faculty learn how to use the software in a way that would actually support their teaching and their students' learning. Um, and there was a faculty member at a community college in California who uh, was very gung-ho about it, took the uh, OLI statistics course, and on the first day of class, you know, showed her students how to log into it and told them, as we had uh, recommended, that they had their students work through the module um, between that class and their next class. And then she could look at the instructor dashboard to see where students were struggling and where students were getting it. And then she could, um, uh, you know, use that to guide the way she supported her students. So she was very excited to do this. And uh, so she, the class was all great. They everyone knew how to log on. They all knew how to use it. They all went off. Um, and she looked at the instructor dashboard right before class, and what she saw was nothing. No, no insights, no learner interactions. Basically, the students hadn't really done anything. So she uh, went into class and asked the students, they were like, well, we didn't really understand this. Could you explain this? Could you explain that? And then, she, so she did. And then very quickly, the class went right back into the traditional way of the students sitting there taking notes while she explained everything. Uh, so this happened two times in a row. Um, and so she called me and said, I don't know what to do. That's not working. You know, there's something wrong. And so we uh, problem solved it and realized that it wasn't just that they, they didn't know how to use the educational technology. It was their, their belief about their role as a learner and their belief about their, her role as an instructor. And so just like you talk about many times in your book, the technology can't do it. The human interactions are what really drive how the technology gets used. So we talked about how could she shift that. And so what I suggested to her is first to do your next class, if you can get a computer lab, do your next class in a computer lab. And this, because the students need to practice learning in this different way and, and building their own confidence and their own ability to be able to essentially teach themselves or support their own learning using these resources. So she got a computer lab. There weren't enough chairs for each student to have a computer. So she had two students on each computer, which I think ended up being not, wasn't our design, but it actually ended up being way better. And so instead of, inst so then she just said, okay, today we're gonna learn how to make box plots. So I want everyone to go to this part in the course and work through the material and, you know, essentially figure out how to build a box plot. And then she just circulated. And if you if you're struggle, talk to the person next to you. You guys can figure it out together. And she circulated around just answering questions about how to use it, not answering questions about how to build a box plot. Then she brought the class attention back up to the front and said, OK, now I want to build a box plot. Who can tell me how to build a box plot? 
and essentially had the, the students then is essentially walk her through what they had just in theory learned from working through the material. And then her, her feedback on that was not just great, you know how to build a box plot, but see you were also able to learn it to the point where you could teach me how to do it. Now let's look at histograms. And so she broke up, it was a, it, also her, I should say her class was an evening class, a seven to 10 class uh, in the evening, three hours long. And so she broke up the class by having them, at least for the next couple sessions, just uh, working through the material and then teaching her as a group how to do what it was they just learned. And then she said, and then after she'd done that a few times when it looked like people could do it, then she said, okay, next time before you come to class, work through this next module. And if you have challenges doing it, you have already a built-in study buddy, the person that you sat next to on the computer. And so then through the rest of the class, that's the way she did it. Now, the, the reason that was impactful to me was at the end of the class, she had one of her students just meet, just essentially bring in a video camera and videotape people's feedback on how the class was for them. And she sent me, it was, tells you how long ago it was, she sent me the video on a CD and it made me cry because the students were saying things like, well, this is the first time I, this is the third time I've taken introductory statistics, but it's the first time I took it the OLI way. And now I'm teaching my friends what a p-value is. And what, what struck me about that was not that they learned statistics, but their, uh, that they were then positioned in authority with respect to the subject. They weren't victimized by statistics anymore. They saw it as something that was a tool for them to use to make sense out of the world. And that, that, was, uh, that, that, that experience is part of what actually compelled me to keep working on uh, the OLI project for as many years as I did. So, so the lesson there is less budget for chairs and more budget for software. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> no, oops. Clearly I failed to make my main point. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the, yeah. I, th I think we all get that the, that the, the, the crucial part of the story is that, uh, you know, a, a constant misconception in education technology is the notion that if we can get people to download software, um, then it will have the desired effect that the programmers put into it. Um, and, you know, and the story, I think, powerfully illustrates how, no, you know, our tools are only as powerful as the communities that guide their use. Um, and making this software tool, not, you know, not just a teaching tool, but a tool for empowering learners to understand a really difficult subject on their own um, was about uh, creating new norms, providing some coaching and support to the instructor, um, you know, finding new kinds of spaces, new kinds of routines for, for the teacher to be able to take advantage of the, of the tool. Um, that, that wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't, even, it wasn't really replacing the teacher with the software. It was creating new kinds of relationships between teachers and students and software that also had new goals. The, the goal not only was to learn statistics, but to learn uh, um, how to be an empowered learner and, and, and the, and a teacher and share. How's that for summary? Is that better? That was great. That was okay. great. Also, I would say also it's a it's a, a to designers out there to always be thinking about how does the software that you're developing or the ed tech that you're developing how does it position the learner? Mm. Does it position the learner as a passive recipient or does it position the learner as someone with authority? And that's always that's always going to be a, a tension um, in designing uh, ed tech. I think. Now, what, what was your ne what was negative story? What story oh, my negative story? story was, again, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, we were doing an intro economics course, and I'd created this really, in, your, in the book chapter, you talk about the calculus curves and creating new technology that allows, allows uh, actual interpretation of what the student is doing when they're drawing a curve 
this was this was a project by some of my colleagues in the math department at MIT, where before they launched a calculus MOOC, they built some new tools that allowed um, students to draw curves and the system to sort of automatically assess those curves. So they had some new assessment types with which to help students develop and demonstrate their understanding. Yep. I think that might have been in the assessment chapter. It was not way it. back in the day. Yep. But in any case, so so we had done a similar thing back in 2002 in teaching uh, economics. We created a, a essentially a little, a little application that allowed people to draw supply and demand curves so that they could uh, and then find the point of, of equilibrium. So, uh, so uh, we've done this little great thing and uh, used it in the teaching of, of economics. It was a whole experiment. Um, the course was a series of economic experiments where the learners were um, essentially economic agents. So they would engage in sort of buying and selling textbooks or cars or monopolies and cartels. So they actually acted as economic agents and they got assigned different roles with different price points and so on. And then after the experiment closed over three days, then they would get the data from the experiment and analyze it to learn the, the principles or the concepts and see if the principles and concepts explained the actual behavior that they themselves exhibited. Cool. So that's the way we did the microeconomics course and the, uh, or the economics course. And so the supply and demand curve thing, and the, the course was really cool, the supply and demand curve thing though, um, what we found was that uh, we were getting all of this feedback that students couldn't plot supply and demand curves, that they would, especially on the supply side, the curve was always wrong. They get the demand curve fine, the supply curve wrong. And so digging into the data to kind of see how could this be, <laughs> Um, we couldn't see what was wrong, just that they were always getting the supply side wrong. So um, I interviewed some students about how did you do this? And a student said, well, I knew that I had to make the label point at the origin and then draw the curve, you know, from the origin out. And I'm like, the label point? There's no such thing as a label point. Um, but in fact, when we had created our little app in order to um, distinguish the supply curve from the demand curve. We had taken the very first point and put a label on it. So they know they were working on the supply curve or the demand curve. And, and they had made meaning out of that. Mm. And so in the, and in the test environment, essentially, the label was not at the origin point on the supply. It was on the last point. And so they meticulously moved that point all the way back to the origin and then plotted the points from that point forward. So they had drawn an absolutely accurate supply curve. Um, it was just from the computer's perspective, the inverse of the curve. So it marked, it scored it wrong. So that was, that was the negative thing. So the automated scoring told us that nobody understood how to draw a supply curve, but it wasn't, it was the interface design. It was, it was it was some some artifact of the of the user experience that you had created that uh, led your students astray and um, also it led them astray both in that and also that then they had a concept of a label point which if which was meaningless mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but they use but they may, so so the other the, the learning there is students will make meaning out of what you give them and you have to monitor your data collection to, uh, it gives you insight into are they making the meaning that you want them to be making? I, I think that's a terrific lead in to this week's discussion um, about, you know, about the toxic power of data and experiment um, and about how, you know, what we're, you, you, had, you had created this interface for a series of purposes. You, it was generating data that, that you could draw inferences from. Um, and there was a, something about the mismatch of meaning between sort of what you intended and what students discovered um, that, that led to this uh, confusion that needed to be debugged and, and made sense of. Um, that's, a, that's a perfect story to, to tie us in with. Um, so, uh, Audrey or Candice, it would be great to hear from you as we have in past weeks. Just, uh, you know, what was your sense of what, what the toxic power of data and experiment is all about? Um, you know, what, what does the chapter intend to do? Um, and then, you know, where, uh, um, where does it fall short or where, or where are there different stories that, that we want to tell? Um, maybe, Audrey, we should let you uh, go, go first for a bit and, and bring us into the conversation. 
Yeah, I thought that there were, I thought that this, this chapter actually, um, you packed a lot <laughs> into this chapter. I appreciated the way in which you actually reflected on your own role as a researcher with the kinds of experiments that you've done with, with data at scale. I thought that that was, I thought it was um, really eff effective and I think um, showed the humility um, that one does not always see in ed tech when it comes to the kinds of pronouncements that we can know. I thought that the important things from this chapter were to recognize that data is a toxic asset or that it, data can be a toxic asset. Um, and that it's also important to know that students are compelled, compelled to use these technologies. And that I think this actually does tie us a bit to what the story that um, Candace just said, that the, the, the idea that you introduce of contextual integrity, that students have a sense, students have a, a sense of, of privacy, they have a sense of, they have their own meaning that they attach to certain circumstances that makes them assess, um, assess whether or not, in this case, whether or not their privacy was violated in ways that I think the, the researcher might not have um, thought about um, because they weren't paying attention to the context in which the students might be interpreting, um, might be interpreting the, the experiment. Good. So just in the same way that Candace realized some feature of her design wasn't being interpreted in the way that students were intending, um, we can imagine that the same issues could happen not just with understanding, but with issues of privacy, with issues of surveillance, with issues of autonomy. You know, a researcher like me could think, oh, everybody must think it's fine to do X. Um, and then students, parents, facility, you know, people who are intermediators can look at the exact same um, setups and circumstances and go, no, 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 that's deeply unethical or that's problematic for these reasons. Um, or that, uh, you know, our, our interpretation of what we see is, is shaped by our, our position and background and so forth. Um, good, and we should go into, you know, some of those kind of key stories and key examples. But, but Candice, what were some of the things that you took away? And, and in particular, what were some of the things that um, you thought were missed or you want to argue against or um, that we should delve into further? Okay. Great. So um, I really like the chapter, um, and I, I like the way you spoke to some of the successes, but you also acknowledged that there has not yet been a big compelling success uh, that would um, that would sort of swing the pendulum saying it's worth the risks that you outline. What, what, what would you put on that list, Candice? If, if you were to make your list of your top sort of whatever number it is, two or three or four, you know, most important contributions from online learning research, learning analytics research, what are, what are the things that you would go, look, of course we should keep doing it. Look at these things that we've done in the past. Well, I do think that, the, I actually think that the, uh, you know, not to, um, <laughs> not, not to, to toot my own horn, but one of them is yours. <laughs> But I actually think that the, the study we did with the OLI statistics courseware was pretty compelling. I actually thought that the Carnegie Mellon study was more compelling than the study um, at the, um, the, the larger study. But that so initially, just to clarify, initially there's a randomized control trial that's happening at Carnegie Mellon. Oh yeah, so I, I can explain that. We did a, so we built this OLI, so OLI stands for Open Learning Initiative. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, it was a project that was funded by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation in 2002, right after they funded MIT OpenCourseWare. And the idea was to use what we know about human learning from all the work that had been done in intelligent touring systems at Carnegie Mellon uh, to inform the design of introductory level um, college courses. And we started with introductory statistics because everyone knows that by gum, that's an, everyone just wants to learn statistics. That's such a natural human drive. Um, and so we made this openly available statistics course available out on the web. And we first started collecting data from the interactions from that course because we realized we would never see the learners. So how did we know whether or not the course was actually supporting someone to learn statistics? So um, before we released it out onto the web, we, uh, we wanted to do some studies to test, was it effective? Did it actually help learners uh, learn statistics? So we did a randomized controlled trial at uh, Carnegie Mellon with the introductory students at Carnegie Mellon that were taking first year statistics. Um, my, my registrar would not let me randomly assign students to condition. I don't know why, 
but they wouldn't. Um, but what they did, that. We'll go back to the registrar later, but keep going. What they did let me do was say, uh, we're running a study to test the effectiveness of this statistics course. Do you want to be part of a study? And of the students who uh, volunteered to be part of the study, we randomly assigned them to condition. And the two conditions were the students in the control condition took the intro stat course the way everyone always took it at Carnegie Mellon, which was three lectures, one a discussion section a week uh, with a textbook for 15 weeks. The students in the treatment condition took the OLI course um, in place of the textbook, met with the instructor twice a week, um, and finished the course in eight weeks instead of the 15, and had the same three uh, midterms and final. And we also did a chaos test, which was somebody else's research looking at uh, that studied statistical not literacy. We did pre and post test on both treatment and uh, control. And the upshot was the students in the OLI course not only completed the course in half the time, but their performance on the chaos pre and post test uh, on the chaos post test was 18 percent. Uh, greater than the students in the traditional course. chaos is an acronym for a standardized yeah it was it was a, a i can look i can we don't, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll put it in the show notes with the with the chaos yeah. test was yeah. some yeah. kind of somebody test. Else it's, not, is, it's not on the subject is, of chaos no no. <laughs> no 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 it was somebody chaos was the acronym for the group that was studying introductory statistical literacy yeah um so, anyway. so, things, so things work at Carnegie Mellon and then your critics say something along the lines of, well, those Carnegie Mellon kids, of course, they're perfectly happy to learn online. They're a bunch of techie nerds. So yes. then there's this follow-up study in which they try to do it in, much, in, in settings that are more like much more of higher education. That's correct. So Bill Bowen, uh, who is the uh, former president of Princeton and former president of the Mellon Foundation, um, sort of saw, was essentially asked to review a book uh, where there was a chapter written about this OL, about OLI. And so he called the president of Carnegie Mellon and said, what is this thing? This might be, it's, this sounds like it could possibly be a solution to uh, Balmol's cost disease. So, uh, but I wanna know if it just works at Carnegie Mellon or if it works in other contexts. So he got his friends from the University of Maryland system, uh, Britt Kerwin, and uh, and said i want to run a i want to run a study in your system and so he ran the second study he and his team ran the second study we weren't involved in it at all where they were looking at could they uh see the same level of acceleration at community colleges state colleges and universities in maryland but they they couldn't get the same study design which we can talk about but they were able to show about a 20 percent uh savings in time across those institutions. So, so, so in the treat, the, but, but the, the one part of the study design is the same is that if you opt into the study, you're randomly assigned to a regular statistics class or a uh, or an OLI um, uh, statistics class. And the upshot was is that the people in the treatment condition got the same grade, um, but spent about twenty percent less time on all activities related to the course. Yes. Um, yeah, that's great. I wonder if we should go back to that registrar, um, you know, because in some ways that registrar is really at the fulcrum of some of the debates in this chapter. Um, you go to the registrar and say, I think I have a way of teaching statistics, which is just as good as the existing method, might even be better than the existing method. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we know about, um, about teaching and learning in higher education, but in lots of other contexts, is that faculty have, in many places, enormous academic freedom. Um, so there can be quite high levels of variation in teaching from one year to the next. Um, you know, if, if, if a teacher just went to their class and said, I want to do some radical way of um, doing teaching and learning this year that was different than last year, no, no registrar or other agent at CMU is likely to, to stop them. Um, and so, you know, every, every time a student signs up for a class, they're getting variation between one version or another. Um, and to some extent, you propose, well, let's systematically evaluate that variation. 
Um, you know, let's, you know, just like sometimes we sort of, you know, you get randomly assigned to a section for certain kinds of things where one teacher might be better than another. Um, let's randomly assign you to this online learning condition or this non online learning condition, just see which one works better. Um, I think for people who have a sort of bent towards research, you know, they kind of say, look, there, you know, there's variation in the system, no matter what, there's variation between last year and this year, between this instructor and that instructor. Um, the only difference with the experiment is that this is variation that we can actually tell whether or not one thing is better than the other. Um, what, what, what's, what's, what's wrong with that argument? Yes. So, and this is the place when you're, when you say, uh, what, what did I think you missed in the book? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you call out that argument really well. So you got that. Um, what I think you missed is the other power of this technology is fundamentally changing the relationship between research and practice. So if, as you rightly call out, faculty, and you just described now, faculty pretty much every semester or every quarter um, change, might change something about how they teach something. And they're doing that because they believe that this new insider, this new way of teaching is going to improve the learning outcomes for their students, even if they don't express it that way. Um, and so then they try something and it works or it doesn't work. But the only person or the only group that benefits from that is them in their class. And so you have all of these people who are building up observations and refining the way they're teaching someone based on those observations over a long period of time. But what this technology enables us to do is give benefit to those structured observations across a whole bunch of faculty instead of just one. And that's what I see is the real, when you said that we, we haven't seen any huge um, sort of seed changes in the way teaching happens, you also make, the, I think, the great point, which is the way change is going to happen is going to be incremental and continuous. I agree. I agree. But what the technology can allow us to do is that incremental and continuous change can be accelerated by having, by benefiting from all the little experiments that all the faculty are doing, whether they're expressly, explicitly calling them an experiment or not. Yeah, that, 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 that learning can be instantiated in a software product in a way that it would be kind of lost um, or, or it is lost every semester when individual lost. faculty get better in their own classrooms, um, but don't um, transmit that knowledge to their colleagues or build into materials or, or those kinds of things. Yes, and it's not just instantiated. Uh, and the, the mistake that we made in OLI on this uh, was or initially was that the, uh, we controlled the authoring environment. We didn't have a WYSIWYG authoring environment. All of those courses were sort of written in, um, uh, in, in languages. There was, we didn't have a WYSIWYG authoring tool as edX. So, so basically only computer programmers who are familiar with the system who were hired by OLI and then a tiny handful of super nerds elsewhere can actually change and modify these things. Yeah, not, not even super nerds elsewhere. Only, only the people in my team. So we ended up with this situation where we had multiple faculty using the OLI statistics course, and they wanted to say, I, want to, I like the way you, I don't like the way you teach sampling distribution. I think I do teach it better. How do I put my sampling distribution way of activity into this course so my students have a seamless, a seamless experience? And the only way at that time that we could do that is we said, oh, great come work with us, <laughs> we, will, we will put it in. And then, and then you can have it in your course. And then if it works, then, then we can try and tell the other faculty that are using the OLI statistics course about this other cool thing you did and ask them, do they want it in their course? Yeah. But it, we were a total bottleneck in that way. And instead, what we need is an environment. And, and Studio tried to get this, to this with edX, allowing faculty to essentially write their own courses um, without a central thing controlling it. The problem there was, because I used Open edX then when I went to Stanford, the problem there was, um, so I could put the OLI statistics course in Open edX. Faculty could use it. They could use Studio to make a modification to it, but then they didn't know. There was no central way of discovering, did that modification actually support their students? 
better or not? And even if it had, how do you share it with somebody else that's using it? So that's the piece of the infrastructure that was missing um, and is to some extent still missing is an infrastructure that supports faculty to engage in this continuous uh, contribution to research and practice. Audrey, what do you think about, and let's go, we, we can talk about this too, but let's go back to the registrar again. So the registrar says no experimentation unless people opt in. Um, what's, what's right or what's wrong about that position or what's right or what's wrong about that question? Um, you know, I, I was listening to what Candace and both you and Candace were saying. I mean, I, one of the questions that I had reading this is, um, and I, was, are the kinds of changes that faculty teachers make um, in, in their lessons year over year, or even, you know, day after day, are those, are those, are those experiments? Um, I, I think that, the, you know, our use of language, they do, they do feel like people, um, they're making change, but I'm not sure that they're necessarily scientific in that, in that kind of a way. I do think that people recognize when things don't work or when they work well, and then they decide to repeat it or replicate it as much as they can the next time around. But I'm not sure there's a level of, there is that same level of experimentation where that, where things are um, thought about it and um, adjusted at the, at the same level when we talk about experiment. So I don't think that what faculty do when they cha make changes in their courses are, are experiments. Although maybe it's a, it, maybe it's just a fuzzy line that some I mean, another, all, so, no, okay. no, I think it's a good point, Audrey. And I guess what's interesting to me, having been a faculty member, um, is and and some and what do I say? Some of my best friends still are faculty members. Is that they can have these two different almost brains that I'm in my research mode, and so yeah. I I I am I'm trying to discover new knowledge, and so I have a very structured approach that I know to take to do that and do that well. And then I shut that off when I go into teaching mode, <laughs> and I and my my goal in teaching is just to tell people stuff. And so what I what I what I tried to do in o, both in OLI and at Stanford was to connect those two parts of the faculty brain, <laughs> and say you know bring the same uh, inquiry into your teaching that you have in your research. And I would tell you honestly, if I had to say what was the biggest success of the first few years of OLI at Carnegie Mellon, I would say the biggest success was we had a, we had a weekly uh, meeting of the OLI faculty. That means if you were working on logic or statistics or economics or French or biology or chemistry, I mean, we were doing many different subjects. And if you were working on an OLI course, you were the lead faculty, you had to come to the OLI statistics faculty meeting. But what those meetings were, were exploration and conversations about how do I get my students to get this concept? And it was, it was an amazing cross-fertilization of, you know, the economics faculty talking with the chemistry faculty, abstracting out the idea of proportional reasoning and how do we get students to get that con you know, the ideas behind proportional reasoning. And then we had the learning researchers there talking about what do we know about human learning. And it, it really fostered this conversation around uh, understanding learning as research. And they, and they did very much get into this, um, they, they got like kids in a candy store where they'd say, oh, I think people will get this chemistry concept better if we do this instead of this. And we could put that into OLI, get the data back, and they would be like, oh, it worked or it didn't work. And so it is to some extent shifting the mindset of how you're engaged in your practice. Audrey, did, 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 you, did you have a follow-up from that? No, that, that, no, that was, that, that's, that's great, yeah. I mean, I think that there's, um, there's an interesting comment um, that Kathy makes in the um, comments it, with a better analogy, is more of an engineering or design analogy. Um, but yeah, I think that, I, I do think that that shift towards um, connecting, connecting the research um, to the practice is certainly that I've, I've seen calls for that grow much louder over just even the last decade. Um, but 
interestingly, we're coming back around to things that aren't tech. This is what you were talking about, Canvas, that faculty meeting. Those aren't techno, that's not a, that's not a techno solution, right? That's, um, that's, a, that's a human, that's, that's the human piece again. And that's a shifting yeah. culture. That's a shifting it, culture piece. It, it, it is, but the technology has to support it. Yes. If the yes. technology interferes with it, which I would argue most of the ed tech out there in the world right now interferes with that, as opposed to having ed tech that says that's the process and how do we design the ed tech to support it? Um, at one year, my students were working on a project to develop something and I don't remember what it was, but we sort of came to this moment where we said, you know, a great question to ask of technology is, what is the human to human conversation that this technology generates? Um, that's kind of like a helpful go to um, learning technology question to ask. Um, what, when, when this technology is introduced in the system, um, what, are the, what, are, what are the ways that people talk to one another in new ways? Um, now, Candace, another thing about these that, systems. Can you expand that idea? It's not just how do people talk to each other in new ways, but um, because because that's just that, that then you're only using the technology to facilitate the human interaction. But there's also how does the technology support the humans in the system to make good decisions? I think that's both facilitating the human to human interaction, but also facilitating productive decision making. Good decision, but for for students for developing you know new fluency and being able to do things, and for um, for teachers to be able to support students in different kinds of ways. But I, I you know maybe one thing is I think um, many education technology developers would say that their goal is to get humans to make different behavioral decisions. Um, fewer would, would discuss the sort of communication dimension of it. Um, now, one of the things that we've talked about in this conversation too, is that in order to discover whether or not systematic variation is happening in productive or counterproductive ways, in order to give students and their educators feedback about how students are doing, we have to collect all kinds of data about people's performance. Um, and one of the things that online learning systems do um, it, for a couple of is they try to ex, you know, exhaustively track what participants in the system are doing. Um, some of that is for research, some of that is for learning, some of that is actually just for simple debugging. Um, in many education technology products, the data that's collected, you know, its primary purpose is like, figuring things out if the system breaks um, rather than doing research or, or other kinds of things with it. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the consequences of that is um, that, the, that the degree to which we can collect data about human experiences in schooling situations is growing dramatically. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly this is being accelerated right now in the pandemic where, um, you know, teachers and students are watching each other, but they're watching each other in these new video recorded kinds of ways um, that might have been used in a limited way before, but are growing now. Um, what kinds of, you know, and, and I think, you know, I tried to argue that there are trade-offs around this. And that, to me, that's what's so compelling about Bruce Schneier's metaphor of a toxic asset. Um, is that, you know, it seems really cool the kinds of research that we can do with this data and the learning that we can do to help learners. Um, but it also seems like, you know, having a giant behavioral dossier of, uh, um, of students is also not a good idea. Um, so how do we, how do we reconcile those, uh, those two things? How, how do you, Candace, how do you think about reconciling that in your work? Um, so, so that's all the, the, you, brought up many things to reconcile. <laughs> Pick one of them. <laughs> so, so, okay, one of them, one of them is to be very clear about uh, the, and this goes back to the assessment chapter too. What's the purpose? If, if assessment is simply collecting evidence to be able to make a claim, that's what you're trying to do with assessment, then the same thing with data collection. What's the purpose for collecting that data and then that should dictate what data you do and don't collect and who has access to it. And I found when I was reading the chapter that sometimes you were munging those things. Mm. Um, and so the, for example, if you're collecting data from the students for the purposes, solely for the purposes of supporting their learning. And when I'm talking about learning in this case, let's make it really simple that the learners um, knowledge state is in one state 
and you're trying to help them put it into a different state. And you can't ever directly see their knowledge state. That's something we always have to infer. So what kinds of activities do you have the learner engage in in order to make an inference about their current state and also whether the learning process is actually supporting them to get to their desired state? Or what do they need to get to their desired state? So if I'm collecting uh, learner data for that purpose, then probably a lot of the stuff that all that clickstream isn't material. What's material are the actions that the learner is taking that is giving me insight into their current knowledge state relative to the desired state. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so then, then I take that information and I have an appropriate knowledge modeling algorithm that takes that information for the purpose of modeling it to get the best estimate so that I can give guidance to the learner or to the instructor who is helping the learner. That would be a very different reason for collecting the data than the reason of uh, summatively assessing whether the learner could, whether I could predict a learner would do something in order to award goodies or not goodies to that learner. And I think that making it really clear, having environments where it's very clear that the purpose of the environment and the collection, the data collection is for the purpose of supporting learning and not for the purposes of um, essentially assessing for summative knowledge, uh, that that distinction is really important. That the only thing you're really assessing in that first case is the understanding where the learner's current state is for the purpose of helping the learner to move states or assessing the effectiveness of the environment in supporting learners to move states. That's a very different data collection regime than collecting data to be able to make a statement about the individual learner that then gives them access or not to other things. And, and you know, so one of the things that we can expand on that is that, you know, um, uh, people who engineer these systems could consistently make those kinds of commitments. There could be professional norms around these kinds of things. You can say, look, if you have a title that's like instructional designer or learning scientist or learning engineer, you have an obligation to collect data aligned with these principles, but not aligned with those principles. Or at least you have an obligation to communicate to people what that data collection is for. And if you sort of held those norms and communicated those norms, to your partners, to your students, to the public, then you could generate a kind of trust um, that would allow that data collection to continue. Yes, um, this, this yes. of course stops um, promises like uh, Newton would make that you know that they could tell you if you learn calculus better on a Tuesday afternoon, you know, or you know, just the and the and the boasts that they were collecting. I think you know a million points of of data from each from each student in the system it's a very so you're you're if you had these sort of ethical professional norms we would probably eliminate many startups yes. right right the, 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 the <laughs> by and large in the industry, one of the claims commonly made is that one of the you know and i think newton is a perfect example that one of the virtues of education technology is we can collect tons and tons of data particularly about things that we don't know will be valuable um, that I think is like the, you know, um, the, 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 the way to go, Candace, from your sort of um, engineering guidelines to something more capacious is to add a kind of dimension of uncertainty. Well, we don't know what kinds of things we might be able to feed into that um, algorithm that would help us go from one knowledge state, a student go from one knowledge state to another knowledge state, but we know that we can collect almost everything. Um, so let's just sort of hoover all of that up. Uh, and make a bunch of spurious correlations like <laughs> it's better for you to learn algebra on Tuesday I bet that's I bet that that, that probably is a strong correlation it's probably like the correlation between uh, getting hit by lightning and getting and eating the amount of cheese that's eaten in Wisconsin on Thursdays that's 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 his website spurious correlations which yes. I'll have to put in the show yes. notes yes. Yes. Show, so, uh, so the problem I mean and I think this this is a failure of a basic understanding of the difference between exploratory data analysis and inference <laughs> you know so so to make an inference you, you kind of have to have a well I won't I won't 
I won't get into my little geekiness there. But I think this is the difference. People think about what's the first rule you teach people in intro stat courses is, you know, association is not causation, but they're correlated. Um, so, it's a little nerdy statistics joke. Um, so the, uh, but in any case, so, so uh, yes, Audrey, and, and yes, Justin, that's, what I, that's why I keep using the word like uh, experiment, even though that's not really the right word. It is more as one of the people in the chat put, it's more like an engineering design experiment. I don't think we're trying to create grand theory about human learning. I think that would be a mistake to try and say we're gonna have grand theory like gravity that's gonna explain everything. It's, it's that reductionist approach doesn't fit. We need to take an adaptive management approach in terms of a philosophy of research more like what the kind of research one does in biology, uh, where you're talking about emergent complex systems. Um, and that's, the, that's the, the theory of research we need to be grounding our learning research in, not something that's mechanistic like physics. You know, I mean, Candace, one way, I, I, think, I think, you know, imagine this startup culture, which is sort of about collect all the data and, and do everything you want with it. You know, you're proposing, uh, a, 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 an amendment which I'm very sympathetic to, which is to, as professionals, put constraints on our own behavior around those things. Um, and you're making two kinds of arguments that I think are important. One kind of argument is a sort of relational ethical one. It says, look, if we want our students to be able to trust us, we have to work in their interests. So let's limit our data collection to things that would help them. Um, but a second one is that we will actually do better science and better engineering with these constraints in place. Um, <laughs> that, the, that the sort of, you know, the myth of the infinite pool of data from which insight kind of magically appears through machine learning algorithm, um, it's a dead end. Um, and, and there's more productive science that we can do, more productive engineering and learning and, and learner support that we can do without that. Um, I mean, my read of the last decade definitely supports that claim. You know, there was, there was widespread hope um, with massive open online courses, with learning management systems, that once we started sort of hoovering up these vast swaths of data, um, like all of these new insights would pour out. Um, but I, and I just don't think that view has been validated at all, that to the extent um, that there have been new useful insights, it's because people have said, um, let's try these particular designs, let's collect these particular data to see if they're working. Um, and, uh, you know, we may, we may have a much longer, more productive relationship with the public, with learners, with these institutions. Um, and do better science at the same time uh, if we apply these kinds of professional uh, restraints, you know, not, not, because, not because anybody makes us, but because, you know, we as, you know, I mean, there's a relatively small group of people who, who have the privilege to be able to build the software, um, to, to do research on it and so forth. Um, and anyway, I, I, think, uh, I think the arguments you're making, I, I find very compelling um, and they seem like important you know, Im important discussions to be had, not just among the people who build these things, but as you've said, um, with all the kinds of partners that, that help us uh, make these learning systems work. Um, yes, I agree completely. <laughs> still, still, a, still a kind of technocratic argument, but you know, it's, it's kind of a restraint on the elites. I don't know. Yeah, I was, but but with, the, with the added dimension, which I, I, I don't know if I failed to communicate, of when we talk, yeah, I know you go against this idea of democratizing education, um, which I agree with all of your reasons for that. What I'm talking about is democratizing education research, putting, putting building new knowledge about how to, how to teach effectively the tools of that back into the practitioner's hands who are working with the researchers. I mean, it, it's sort of like if you think about uh, medicine, I might, I might, I, I thought about this as an analogy, it may be wrong, um, which is if I'm a doctor and I'm trying to make a decision, a treatment decision for a patient that's presenting with a particular illness, I read the literature and I see what randomized controlled trials have done to give me guidance on which of these two treatments to select. Unfortunately, the variables that they controlled for in those two researchers are not controlled for in my patient. <laughs> my patient has all the things that they controlled for. So I don't, I can't really make a good decision by just looking at the research between these two treatment choices. 
but I have to make a decision because I have to treat my student, my, my patient. So I make a decision. And I, and I might even rationalize why I, why I made that decision as opposed to the other decision. But that gets documented. And then someplace, there's going to be an outcome for that patient. And while that doesn't meet the standard of sort of randomized controlled trial, it is a piece of evidence about what decision was made and what happened. And if you had doctors all over the world essentially doing that, then the next time a doctor had to make that decision and it wasn't in the research literature which one to do, they have this whole other source that, that there were 20 doctors who made that decision and there's patients that, that have the variables that are most like mine, my patient, and this, this was the outcome of their decision. And so I can use that to help guide my decision. And I think that we could get faculty participating in the same kind of community-based research activity. That's great. I think so too. Audrey, do you have sort of final thoughts about the toxic power of data and experiment? Are there things that we missed in this conversation that we should uh, make you know, sure to bring up as we come to the close? In one place you talk about, you didn't think that, I think you were talking K through 12 school districts, didn't have the expertise to do data, to deal with data management and that you didn't think that they would develop the expertise. And I wonder, um, I agree with what Candace was saying as well, um, but I wonder how we, how we help develop this expertise, not just in sort of managing data, right, but how do we help develop this expertise um, in school districts and, you know, particularly cash-strapped, resource-strapped resource school districts, how, you know, how do we practically get, you know, get districts, get schools there, how do we get them there? I think, I think one component of it can be connected to what Candace is talking about, which is that there, you know, one of the resources that schools have is an inexhaustibly curious faculty. Um, and they're exhaustibly busy and they're exhausted, but they're inexhaustibly curious. And so one kind of bottom up starting point um, is to say, that the people who are building these tools um, and the people who are implementing them in schools have obligations as part of their practice to think about democratizing these processes, not democratizing as in you know, exporting resources from elite universities to, um, to the far flung corners of the world, but through making the people who um, purchase, use, lend, borrow our resources, meaningful partners in what we're doing. Um, you know, in, in, one could imagine that uh, in any school system, you know, that's, I don't know, that's using Khan Academy, um, that Khan Academy could, could publish size like, hey, three times a year, we're going to have a, um, here's the research that we're doing and here's what we're doing with your data. Come learn about it. Um, and I don't know how many of the hundreds of thousands of math teachers in the United States would sign up, but a bunch of them would. Um, and those folks, you know, those folks would sort of volunteer to have some more expertise. I mean, I think um, at a, you know, there's a lot of complexity here, but one starting point is to say that if we are, if we're asking people who have the sort of power over these tools and machines to engage in meaningful conversations um, with people who are stakeholders in different kinds of ways, um, that's a good start. And it'll be good for two reasons. One is that um, we'll get better ideas and better perspectives. And, you know, going back to Candace's example of the mismatch between her and her team's ideas, a desi designer and her students, what they saw on the other end, um, we can, we can, you know, sand down some of those communication mishaps. Um, but then more importantly, I think if, if, if people in the field of education technology are really committed to hosting those kinds of conversations, like it's through those sort of bottom up conversations, that's where trust is built. Um, and, you know, the trust will be built both because we're transparent about what we're doing and because schools will tell us when we're doing stupid things and, you know, we'll stop. Um, so those are sort of two mechanisms I can, I can imagine. Well, um, this has been a very rich conversation. Uh, uh, thanks so much to all of you who joined us uh, for this hour online. Um, Audrey Waters, thanks always for joining me. Uh, Candice Dill, thank you so much for coming and, and being here. It was great to be able to get your perspective and, and your wisdom on these topics. Thanks. This was really fun. 
Um, we have one more conversation left, uh, a conclusion, a wrap up. Uh, we've got Kevin Gannon and Kathy Davidson coming in along with Audrey to help us um, combine some of these themes together. And I hope many of you will come and join us for that conversation. Um, uh, it'll be uh, the, the Monday before Thanksgiving. So we'll wrap up before the holidays. Um, really wonderful to have you all here and have a great afternoon and rest of your week. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.